many notes today, but it'll be pretty straightforward. section it's kind of a mix it's two four two five i'm mixing together two four didn't have too many um too many items in it of value that we needed but i'm going to mix it with two five and it will hopefully make sense as we go through it okay so we're um, we're moving on to what we call postulism proofs and the reason why i want to go on to this one and why i'm kind of skipping around is that what we've been learning is conditional statements an if then statement right if this then this well how they write properties for geometry is in that form so like um, the properties we're going to talk about today are postulates and proofs, right? So the things we're going to talk about today, law of detachment, we're going to talk about an example of that, what that means, law of syllogism, uh, which is do an example, and then we're going to introduce the postulates today, um, or what they are better known as axioms. I'll go through what that definition is, like what is a, what is a postulate. Uh, some people listen, we need to know what that means. It's, a, it's our first type of property we're actually going to get now. Uh, we see our first ones now. Um, there's about 17 postulates throughout your textbook. We don't see them all. We see the majority of the ones that we need. Um, but um, we'll get to this. So I'll, I will give you the definition of that here in a minute. This is where we're going to get to today. In fact, we're going to do a couple postulates. We're going to go postulates 2-1 to 2-7 today, or at least attempt to. I don't want to go too far. Um, and I'll explain what that word means and why there is technically seven of them today, 1 through 7. Right? Okay, so that's what we're going to go through. Now, I know there's other properties. When you look at chapter 2.5, some people do that. They just kind of scan ahead. There's a ton of theorems as well. There's, I think, theorems 2.1, 2.3, 2.4. We, um, we'll get to that. We're actually going to do proofs for those. So hopefully that makes sense. This will not be today. This is what we're, we're going to talk about tomorrow. Um, and we'll get to that. So we'll be coming into that, okay? Um, today, um, just make sure that uh, homework do um, at the... Uh, do what tomorrow, I think? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do tomorrow. Yeah, so, do Friday. So, yes, that was the one that you were interested in. Yeah, that's the first one. Like, I think grades for you guys are all up to date. Everything is entered. I'll hand back papers today. Um, you only had one assignment that was out still, but I'll hand it back today. So, if you need to make corrections, today is kind of the last day. If you have late work, redo assignments. And you can make refixes on that one. Did you really take one test in the last quarter? Yeah, the big test, chapter one. It was right at midterm. So. Um, this chapter test is, I think it's as soon as end of next week, something like that. So it's important time. So, okay, all right. Let's talk about law of detachment. Let's go through this first. So, um, why didn't move my computer? Okay. Okay. So law of detachment. Um, it is using deductive reasoning. So a law of detachment is. A way that you justify a conclusion to a problem by using deductive reasoning. Deductive, if you don't remember, it's straight memorization. So um, the example that the book uses is um, okay. uh, the example the book uses is uh, they try to come up with a valid conclusion by just simply memorizing something. So one of the examples I always tell people is let's say that um, Hanson, you and Mullins here are the same age. And Mullins, you're 16, let's say. So then how, how old would how old would Hanson have to be? Yeah, you just did law of detachment. I didn't tell you that, but I, I told you that they're the same age. This person is 16, and you associated that they have to be the same age. That's detaching. You're detaching the information that you knew they were 16, and you applied it to something else later, because I explicitly told you the answer. It'd be like if I were to stand up here on a test day and say, hey, the question for number one is 10 and then go through the questions, and then you just later on just spit out the answers. Like, oh, number one is 10. You're detaching the information I gave you and attaching it to a new spot on the test. You just knew where to put it. That's, it's taking straight deductive reasoning, or I guess, and Okay, so So it is just losing its mind. So okay. So so law of detachment. Here's our parts. Okay, the example that I want to tell you. If p and if p then q. So these are some statement. P is a statement in math. Q is a statement. 
that was a true statement, we're going to assume that this is true. Um, there's no counterexample to it. Um, P is true, then Q is true, that type of thing, because that's how you get a true statement. When we're using if then statement, they both have to be true. Um, so, given your bank account is empty, you will not be able to purchase something. Okay, just think about that. If your bank account is empty, you won't be able to purchase something. So, the idea is that, okay, you have your money. What if I told you my bank account is empty? Okay, then what can you, what's your logical valid conclusion you can make from that? So, if I tell you if my bank account is empty, then I will not, I will not be able to purchase something, and Mr. Ward's bank account is empty. Exactly. That's detaching. You would detach this piece right here, that I am not able to purchase something, and you apply it to something else. Because you understood, you attached that when you're out of money, you can't buy something, and now if somebody else is out of money, they can't buy something. You're detaching. A lot of people do this all the time. You know, you, you figure out, you watch somebody do something, it's like trial and error, right? You watch somebody biff it on a bike, and you're like, well, I'm not going to try that, because I'm detaching that I'm probably going to do the same thing. That's, that's a law of detachment. And you're detaching information you previously learned and applying it to a new situation. But it's just straight memorization. You didn't come up with anything new. Like, you just said, I won't be able to purchase something. I could have taken out a loan and bought something. Think about that. A loan, you can get some money. You have to pay it back. But, you know, it gives me money now, and I can go purchase it. You didn't even think about that. You just thought about, I couldn't buy anything. Okay, because you didn't, you couldn't apply new things. You couldn't think outside the box. Okay, now, the law of syllogism. I think it's syllogism. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, the idea is that it's using deductive reasoning, but it's more, I'd say it's more inductive um, than deductive, but the books is, is a type of deductive. You're still coming up with a valid argument. But the example that I always tell people for, um, for syllogism is that you can string items together so it's like a daisy chain of events happening, okay? Um, so it, it would, um, it's comparable to me like, you know, I did the example of Mullins and um, Hanson here, but now I can attach it to like three people or four people where you can make the connection all the way in. Like um, Mullins here is the same age as is Hanson and Hanson's the same age as Caden. Caden's the same age as Zach and Zach's the same age as Jack. And and I tell you in the very beginning that Miss Mullins here is 16. Well, then how old is Jack at the very end of the daisy chain? 16. That's syllogism. You're daisy chain connecting things together and making that logical conclusion between the beginning and the end of a problem. Not just one step problem, multiple steps of people, and you made that connection. I didn't tell you he was 16. I just said they're the same age and she's 16. You connected the dots there. That's, that's syllogism. Okay? It's connecting. It's like a daisy chain. Okay, so if P, then Q, and if Q, then R, so there's like multiple things happening back to back. It's like a, like you have to go through a checklist to get to certain things. So if you start with the first thing is true, the second thing is true, the third thing is true, then here's my example. You have a square, you have a rectangle. Okay, here's a square, here's a rectangle. Okay, well, if I tell you you have a rectangle, then you have a parallelogram. So there's a daisy chain, right? You start with a square, well that's a rectangle, and a rectangle is a parallelogram. So if I just, so that's my that's my daisy chain of events. You start with a square, it's connected to a rectangle, four rectangles connected to a parallelogram. Well, the logical conclusion is, if you start with a square, you can just jump to the end and say that it's a parallelogram as well. Or even further, you know, I connect these all together and a parallelogram is a quad. Well now you can jump from the beginning to the end and say a square is a quad. At the very, very end. You're connecting events together. A lot of people can do that. It's I, I think the best way to think of syllogism is like bartering for things. What I mean by that, um, the most, the, the, the craziest example I've ever heard of somebody bartering, uh, like trading for things, is somebody, um, they always have these stories of people that start with a paper clip and they end up with a Ferrari. And you're thinking, how does that work? Because they documented all the trades they made on like an Amazon or a, a eBay or a, um, a Craigslist ad. And they, they document what they traded the paper clip for to somebody else, and what they traded that item for, and that item for, and they document the whole thing, and they make a big long story, like it's an epic grand tale, and they say, hey, my paper clip bought a Ferrari. Because they're doing this. They started with a paper clip, they ended with a Ferrari, and they said, oh, that's what I paid for it. Not really. 
know, it probably took them years to do it, and they got lucky with some some lucky uh, some lucky gambles. Some, with some items. Okay. Um, do we see the differences? Syllogism, you're connecting a daisy chain of events versus just the last one, which is detachment, is just one event happening, and you can just use that information to do something else. It's not connecting multiple chain of events together. Okay, now, the re that was the whole point of section 2.4. That was it. That's all they tell you. And they ask a bunch of questions on it, like blah, 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 blah. It's not enough to warrant me to give you homework on it. It's just, it's fun to talk about it so you can see that there is some type of logic there. Everyone has it, everyone uses it. Okay, today. The goal of today was to talk about postulates. Do you know what a postulate is? And can, can we actually learn the first few of them today? So postulate or, quote unquote, an axiom in math. Um, they are something that, it is some type of mathematical statement that we, as, that we, we accept as true. There's no arguing with it. It's, we accept it. Now the basic things in math that we accept as true. Um, I have a couple things here on the slide, but like a major thing is like just simple arithmetic. Basic arithmetic is like when you actually do math. Like for instance, what's two plus three? Five, right? And ignoring that example I gave you yesterday, two plus three is five. That's that's just something that you learn. Like how do you argue against that? You can't. It's, it's something so inherently easy that you're just like, well, I just know it. It's 2 plus 3 is 5. Well, how do you prove it? You actually count with your fingers, but that's about it, right? There's no way of showing it. But there's other things in math that we assume are true. That we have to start with basics. It's basic operations stuff. Stuff you start with in like general math, right? So basis of mathematics. So the idea is an axiom is the same thing. An axiom is some same definition of a postulate. We assume an axiom is just basic mathematics. Now, there's there's some riddles out there that we'll eventually get in this chapter that talk about an axiom, like how do you know it's true? Try to prove it. It's, it's one of those things like you can't prove it. It's just so inherently simple. It's just it's hard to define it. That's a postulate. We we have basics. We have real basic properties in geometry that we start with. Something that's so simple, we can't argue it. And we use that later to prove stuff. Okay, so do we understand what the first word is? Postulate. We don't, we don't prove these, we use them. Because they're just simple. So we're going to get to the first couple today. So I'm going to fly through these. So here's the first one. 2-1. This is postulate 2-1. Now, how they number these? Chapter 2, this is the first one we're learning. That's how they number them. So chapter 2 is the first postulate we're learning. Usually some of these have names, some of them don't. Um, if, that, if there's a name, I always put it over here. Uh, we'll see you in a minute. So here's the first postulate you're ever going to learn. Through any two points you have on your paper, you draw, there is exactly one line passing through them. Well, that's pretty hard to argue, right? Because the definition of line has two points. You can't really argue with that. It's a definition. How do you how do you argue a definition as in a you know a dictionary? If there are any two points, there's exactly one line. So you have to start with the points. One line can be drawn through them. <coughs> Fair enough. Okay, so let's go to the next part here. You want me to stop? Okay, all right. So any two points, there's exactly one line. I'll give you a little bit of time to write. I'll tell you another picture here. Let me just give you the picture. There you go. So I have two points, P and R. I can draw a line through it, and what is the name of that line? N. N. Or you can call it line PR, where you put like the PR with the arrows above it. So that's my example. By the way, that's a picture of your book. Yeah. That's something we'll probably see for like test days. We'll see pictures like this. So any two points, there's exactly one line going through them, and notice they have arrows. It is a line, a type of line. Right? Okay, anyone else need it? Are you good? Sure. Down good. Are you good? Are you good? Yeah. Anyone else need it? Sure, are you good? Yeah. All right, here we go. 2-2. Two, two. I'll let you write this one. Through any or through any three non-planar points, there's exactly one plane. So 
So again, that's the definition of what a plane is. Planes have non-collinear points, three of them, more specifically. So if there are any three non-collinear points, there's exactly one point. Now, non-collinear, remember what that means? Um, there's three of them, but non-collinear means not in a code line, so not lining up together. So that, that makes one, and they use a very specific word, exactly one plane. So when you pick three points not in a straight line, yeah, you can draw a plane that would hit all of them. So usually the book does something like that, where they, they draw the actual like <coughs> box around it. Remember, it's a plane that doesn't have edges. You know, it looks like it does. But they have to be not in a straight line, because if I put them in a straight line with each other, now there's an infinite number of planes that could touch them. You know, I could have a marker board, that could be a plane. I could have a piece of paper going this way through them, that's a different plane. I could put a piece of paper going this direction, that's a different plane, it's at a different angle. There is an infinite number of them. That's why they have to be in not in a straight line. Is the only way that, that a plane could touch all three at the same time now is if it's the marker board. Because no matter which two you pick, you won't hit the, the other one unless you use the marker board to do it. That's why they say non-collinear. But again, why is this a postulate? It's literally the definition. So that's usually what we fall back on. When the definition is so important, or it's, it's stating some type of mathematics, that's usually a postulate. Like, one of the things I know we're going to get, uh, on your last previous chapter one test, we added segments together, sticks. Well, that's an actual postulate. We get that later. It's called segment addition postulate. Okay, you can add sticks together to make a bigger stick. Because it's the definition of segments. Right? All right, number three. And by the way, there's your picture. So the plane, I have three dots on it. Um, K is actually the name of the plane, so we call this plane K, or we can call it plane ABC. I don't really care what we call it. But that's a plane. Remember, there's no edge, even though it looks like there is. It continues in all directions without limits, all that good stuff. Three dimensional pictures like planes, it's super hard to draw that, but you get the idea. Okay, questions, comments? Perfect, let's move on. Two, three. A line contains at least two points. So now, I'm not just starting with two dots and I'm going to draw a line connecting them. I'm saying that when you are given a line, there has to be a minimum of two points on it, at least two points. Now, when you actually think about a line, like this, there has to be a minimum of two on there, but how many points are actually on this line if you think about it? Yeah, there's an infinite number. Now, I know there's so many letters of the alphabet, but you can create your own symbols for the other ones. There's an infinite number of them, but there has to be at least two for you to name it. So in fact, I think I gave you a picture here where I show you a line where there's like three. P, Q, and I. And we call that line N again. There was actually the same picture. I just took out a Q earlier. Photoshop it down. Okay, so any line is given has two points on it, at least. Okay, again, it's super hard to argue these because they're just definitions. We don't need to prove it. That's a definition of a line. Two points on it. <coughs> okay, we good so far. Well, I have a couple more. I'm not joking. These are easy. They're postulates, right? The hardest part is just remembering to keep them straight. How I remember this? 2, 1, talk about lines. 2, 2, talk about a plane. This one talks about lines. What do you think 2, 4 is going to talk about? Planes. Planes, Planes again. Plane contains three non collinear points. So no, we're not starting with points. We're starting with a plane. There has to be at least a minimum of three dots on it. So here we go. Here's picture. It was the same picture earlier. I don't know if they used the same letters. Right. 
So if you have a plane, it will contain at least three points. Now, how can I name this plane? Plane K. Plane K. Plane, what's another name I could call it? LECB, BEC. -E I could just call it three points, but I have to put plane in front and pick a minimum of three points. Minimum of three, at least three. Pick all four, but don't, don't mix K with the other ones. Don't call it plain black. Don't call it that because you can't use K. All right, now, now that we have the basics, right? We have we have the original like two, the line where if you're given two points, you draw a line through it. If you're given three point three nonlinear points, you draw a plane. You can, if you're given a line that has two points on it, if you're given a plane that contains three points. Now with the next couple of let's talk about what happens when they start crossing each other and they start interacting. That's what we're going to talk about. We only have three more. These are pretty straightforward, and then I'm done for today. Okay, I think three. We have two, three, two, seven. All right, two points. Line of plane, the entire line, um, and contain those points lies in that plane. So two points lie in the plane. Then the entire line that contains those points also lies in the plane. So now we're we're talking about interactions with objects, planes and lines. So. Let me give you the picture. So this, hopefully this makes sense to you. You start with two points that you draw on this plane, let's call this plane K. We're gonna put two points on it. When you draw the line going through them, that is using the, uh, postulate two one, when you draw the line can, that connects the two points, that entire line has to be on the plane K. Well, yeah, because the way I have it drawn, when you have two points on a plane, the line would also be on the plane because there's the, the plane is infinite in length. So there's an infinite number of points so they draw a line on it. It continues in all directions. So it's going up the definition of what a line is using Pasha 2 1 and what a plane is. Planes have infinite number of points on them as well. But it's a Pasha. It's hard to argue like against it. Because if here's the here's the other side of it, thinking about this backwards. If the line wasn't on the plane, it would be doing something like this that it would peel off of the plane, it wouldn't be flat on it. Well, is that an actual line? No, that's a curve, it's like a parabola. So you could argue it that way. I mean, that's that's an argument you can make that it wouldn't even be a line in the first place if it curved and it peeled off of the plane. It's not flat anymore, it's not straight. That's 2-5. Two, 2-5 two, is what we're talking about a line on a plane. Two six. Two lines cross each other. So you have two lines, they're going to intersect. Well, they're going to intersect at exactly one point. One spot where they're going to cross. Because the word intersection, if you go back and you look at the definition, it's when geometric figures share common points. Points like plural to be more. Well, when the lines cross and they they have they share a point. That's called an intersection. It's like this. So that was one of the test questions we had in chapter one, right? Name the intersection of these two lines, line S and line T. Where do they cross? Point P. That's exactly how you named it. Because that's that's a postulate. It's a definition. They're sharing at least one dot. If they shared more, then they'd have to share all of them. If they're sharing two or more, they're sharing everything. They're right on top of each other. Usually the lines cross at one spot. Now here's the weird thing. When we talk about Euclidean and non-Euclidean geometry, Euclidean means they believe that parallel lines exist. Non-Euclidean believes that every line eventually will do this. No matter where you draw your line, they will always eventually cross. No matter if they look parallel or not. Somewhere down the road they will meet. They will converge. Intersect. So like our the other view. Okay, the last one today, this is our last, absolute last postulate today. I'm going to give you the last 15 minutes today to work. Two planes intersect. They will intersect at a line like this. So when two planes cross, they make a line. It's kind of like the idea is I think I used an example in class. I get a piece of bread and you had a butter knife, and you and you put the butter knife on the bread and you pull, well, you're going to make a line on the bread. Or you're going to cut the bread. 
So there are two planes. You have your bread, you have your knife, and you pull the knife through, it cuts the bread in a perfect line. It's like when my corners and my walls meet over there. They make a perfect line in the corner of the room. I get, it's a very distinct line in the corner. Like where the floor and the ceiling meet, you know, that, that type of thing, you know, or uh, the wall and ceiling, I should say. The wall and ceiling, where they meet. They make a distinct line going across the top. Okay, that's all your postulates. You can't argue them. They're just properties. The rest of the time today, you have about 15 minutes today. You can work on your page 111. In fact, I'm going to put that back on the board here just so you have it. So remember, this is the assignment I gave you yesterday. It's due tomorrow. It will be the first assignment on the next quarter. Remember, kind of what we talked about. I'm, I'm thinking we're going to have a test next Friday. That's what I'm tempted. So keep that in mind. So test about a week from tomorrow. I would like to warn you of that. So page 111, numbers 1 through 8. 10 through 13, 16, 17, and then you have 35 through 46, and 47 through 52. Now, remember, the first couple, they just want you to identify a hypothesis conclusion. Don't tell me if the sentence is true or false. Um, some of them will have you write counters and inverse and counter positives. Some have you doing counter examples. That's where you have to tell me if the sentence is true or false. Remember, if the sentence is so inherently crazy, I think the example I use for you guys I see is like, if pigs can fly, then I'm taller than the Statue of Liberty or something like that, right? Yeah. That sentence is actually true because you can't, you can't disprove their hypothesis because the hypothesis was science fiction. So the rest of it would be true because anything's possible in science fiction. All right, but there you go. There's your own. There's your own. Yes. Are you in the lights for me, sir? Thank you.